Hello, BookTube. I have a mail haul for you here, brought to me by my heroic mail truck driver who made his way through a dark and rainy day here in Boston. Of course, dark and rainy days are on my mind because I've been looking at the, the news and the weather data. Uh, a major Category 4 hurricane is bearing down on the coast of North Carolina. Probably hit there at the end of the week. Uh, it's tough to tell, but this thing has a wide stretch of warm ocean water to draw on. It will probably be very strong by the time it hits the, the relatively cooler water along the shore and before it hits the air mass of the shore. And those things are bad news because uh, those com that combination could cause this thing to hit the coast and sort of stall in place, uh, dumping astronomical amounts of rain the whole time I, do I I've been studying it and I've been I've been watching most of the most of the news forecasts uh, that you can get now are the usual uh, hyperventilating the, the usual feature stories and fear-mongering that is designed by network weather forecasters to uh, accumulate ratings to get hits and clicks uh, but if you if you leave that out completely, if you just look at the data, it looks bad <laughs> for for the for the southern coast of the of, of uh, America. It looks bad. Uh, tons and tons of rain and probably lots of storm damage as well. And not the only storm. <laughs> there are two other formed storms, each of which could get just as bad or worse. And God knows where they would strike. One of them looks to me like it will probably veer into the Atlantic and probably expend itself over open water. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> uh, anytime, anytime that uh, any kind of projected st uh, storm track for these weather systems suddenly tacks at a right angle and heads north, anytime that I see that, even when it looks like the tacking will be benign, uh, my heart flutters a little <laughs> because uh, uh, North Carolina and, and the Gulf Coast and all in Florida, they, they at least have institutional memory. But a terrifically strong hurricane coming up the eastern seacoast and striking areas that are totally unprepared. Well, we saw that. We saw what that was like with Hurricane Sandy. What if that were worse? I, I, uh, I don't know, and I'm hoping that I don't find out. But either way, the, the uh, 2018 hurricane season has kicked off with a vengeance. So it's on my mind. <laughs> and it's also preventing me from complaining about about dark rainy weather here in Boston because I'm not being told to evacuate my home with little Frida tucked under my arm. I'm not heading to the grocery store and finding row after row after row of completely empty shelves. <laughs> so uh, a little rain I can probably deal with. And we'll, we'll try to brighten things up with, uh, with these packages. We'll see what we have here. The first three are fairly skinny. And Steve doesn't like skinny books, so who knows what they will be. They could be, could be we'll, we'll have a nice surprise in a skinny package. Uh, let's see. Do you want this little bean? You have your chew toy. You might not want this. Who am I kidding? <laughs> of course she does. <laughs> let's see if we can make sure you see her. <laughs> there you go. All right, prepare for the sounds of destruction. All my mail halls now take place in the soundtrack of destruction. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, this is uh, the other press. Boy, it, it's a lovely finished thing. I don't know if we saw this originally. This comes out later in the month. It's a thin thing. It's by Theodore Califatides. Or Califatides. Here, no, 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 no. You have an empty one, Frida. You don't attack the ones that have books in them. You could have the empty ones. There you go. <laughs> uh, this is, it's a quite lovely thing. It's uh, Theodore Califatides. Uh, it's Another Life. Isn't that nice with the gold, the gold uh, bordering there? Uh, what is this? As the author ruminates on his own aging and the way it affects his writing, he observes the chaotic, combative Europe that surrounds him and contrasts it to his everyday routine in Swedish and Greek friends who keep him grounded in a simpler, more stable time. While the author studies the various culture wars and economic issues that have transformed his birthplace of Greece into a concerning mix of national crises waiting to implode, 
and looks on as his beloved Sweden moves towards privatized institutions and worrisomely intolerant views all over the news today, uh, the, the intolerant views of, of their political right. Uh, he struggles with the frustration of his creative status, stasis, sorry. Uh, the personal and political are synthesized in another life through the thoughts and recollections of the, that the author presents producing a bright, engaging memoir that highlights the inextricable link between a writer and his inspiration. Full of profound questions on the nature of aging. And there is our author. Uh, so this comes out at the end of the month. I don't... I, uh, I can't remember if we got an advanced copy, or if I showed it on camera. I certainly haven't read it. It's a slim thing, though, so I should do it. Uh, since it's the end of the month, I should do it right away. So let's see. This is another, another slim package here. And my, my little miniature schnauzer has classic Christmas morning syndrome, where the, the next present, the one she hasn't opened, is the one she wants, not, not the one she just did open. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, oh, okay. All right, we saw this before. Uh, this is from Penguin Books. Okay, you have a, a long interview here. Uh, this is Thomas Ligotti, uh, Conspiracy Against the Human Race, in the finished, uh, the finished Penguin paperback. Uh, this, this is also more on the line of, uh, of navel-gazing. It looks like just like the first book. Uh, it's due in, the, in early October, and the conspiracy against the human race dares to posit, quote, everything in existence is malignantly useless. That's not true, is it? I have uses. <laughs> you want to know whether or not a new book is any good? I have lots of uses. <laughs> Uh, despite the book's philosophical pessimism, however, uh, the author described it in weird fiction preview as a kind of inspirational quasi-self-help book. Okay, well, uh, his ho supernatural horror fiction, some of which I believe I have in a Penguin classic, is ranked among the most distinguished and disquieting in the genre. His first non-fiction book is no less estimable in exploring various domains to similarly disturbing effect. Okay, all right. Uh, I don't. I don't know that an author's musings on uh, on fate and society are going to disturb me. <laughs> I tend to reserve my disturbing reading for books on how we don't have any privacy, how there's a gigantic earthquake coming that we aren't prepared for in any way, or the old reliable in terms of disturbing reading, the Yellowstone supervolcano. <laughs> If you don't know what that is, feel free to look it up on YouTube, but be prepared uh, to have your uh, your giblets frozen solid in terror. <laughs> it, is, it is not a, a volcano that has long been dormant underneath Yellowstone National Park and is long overdue, statistically speaking, actuarially speaking, for an eruption. It is not that. That would be bad. It's a super volcano. Ten times the size of a volcano. It's a super caldera. And it's long overdue for an eruption, and when it goes, so do we. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's move on to this third thin package. You're going to want this, right? Because you're just, you're, you're getting through these things in no time at all. <laughs> she's, not, I mean, she's not even touching them. She's going from one to the next. Maybe she's waiting for something a little more uh, satisfying than something flat. Flat things don't tend to do it for. Uh, let's see. Let's see what this next one is. Okay, this is a paperback original, again from Penguin. This is Simon Van Bui, The Sadness of Beautiful Things. Uh, and this comes out, again, in early October. These are all early October. Uh, the compact yet capacious stories in this collection possess something beautiful, and permanent at their core, as they take readers into the extraordinary inner lives of ordinary people. The author wrote seven works of fiction, including Love Begins in Winter, and in here he has penned a wise and deeply intimate collection that explores the marvelous, strange ways in which we experience the world. 
Okay. All right. So a slim volume of uh, of short stories. So we have a, a a slim manifest, a couple of slim nonfiction manifestos, and a slim volume of stories. So those are our slim alternatives. <laughs> for the, we started off with three slim books. Uh, let's, let's move on. This one is. Uh, slightly thicker and feels like a finished copy and it will also please a certain someone a lot more because it's not flat it's this rubbery uh, envelope that doesn't tear easily so it it defies little Frida and that infuriates her <laughs> this might produce more py pyrotechnics uh, okay all right, next one is fiction, and uh, I don't know that we've seen it. <laughs> it's due in late October, uh, and it is it's by B. A. Shapiro, and it's the Collector's Apprentice. This is the author of the Art Forger, a novel that some of you have probably read. It was it was uh, a word of mouth hit of a kind, and did well with book clubs. Uh, Okay, so what, what have we got here? Uh, that is the cover. Triangulus. We're only dealing with, with uh, artificial light. There is no natural light in Boston today. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. This is the author's third book. Uh, and it takes readers to, <laughs> to Paris in the 1920s. And the ever-fascinating world of Gertrude Stein's Salon and the artists such as Matisse and Picasso, with whom she surrounded herself. These and other real-life icons are deftly integrated into a gripping mystery involving love, intrigue, murder, and, of course, art. Okay. Kind of surprised the Hemingway's name hasn't come up yet. Uh, when she is accused of playing a role in a Ponzi scheme perpetrated by her erstwhile fiancé, Pauline Mertens seeks solace and sanctuary in Paris. Never a good idea. <laughs> Where she creates a false identity as a French woman named Viviane Gregsby. As Viviane attempts to recover her father's art collection, stolen along with her family's assets, and prove her innocence. The eccentric and wealthy American art collector Edwin Bradley offers her a job. She is soon immersed in the world of expatriates and post-impressionist art becoming Matisse's lover and traveling between Paris and Bradley's native Philadelphia, where he is building an art museum. So this is going to deal uh, with art as well. That, that's interesting. Always interesting to me when, when a novelist pursues and uh, explores an arena more than once. It, uh, I, don't, I don't view it as an, ab an abdication of your imagination at all. It's the, the art world clearly fascinates. Uh, B.A. Shapiro. And who is B.A. Shapiro when she's at home? That is our author. Uh, and uh, her books have been selected as community reads in numerous cities and translated throughout the world. Yeah, their their book, the Art Forger, especially was a book club's favorite. Uh, before becoming a novelist, she taught sociology at Tufts University and creative uh, writing at Northeastern University. Okay, uh, so we have historical fiction. Gertrude Stein, uh, due in. In mid-October. I don't know if she's going to want to abandon that for anything new. Let's see. Uh, let's see, because these manila things are just paper, and these she can tear apart. The the uh, rubber white ones, see, she's been thrashing at it. It hasn't made any effect at all. She can't litter the floor with confetti if she has things like this. Uh, and she won't do it with the flat ones, because they're not worth her bother. But this, she can make a snowball out of this. So let's, let's see if she does. All right, what have we got here? Oh, oh, very good. Okay, fantastic. Uh, okay, this is due in late October. Uh, and this, we saw the advanced copy of this. Now I have the very pretty finished copy. Wonderful. <laughs> this is Gene Moorcroft Wilson's Robert Graves biography. Uh, from Great War Poet to Goodbye to All That. So, a youngish Robert Graves. Uh, Wonderful. Okay, so what have we got here? On November 11th, 1985, when the Poet Laureate Ted Hughes unveiled a memorial stone in Westminster Abbey to 16 of the first World War poets, 
Robert Graves' name was among them, even though he virtually suppressed all the poems uh, he published during and just after the First War. Until his son William Graves reprinted almost all the poems, uh, Graves' status as a war poet depended mainly on his prose memoir, Goodbye to All That, which you should all read. Uh, of the previous biographies written on Graves, none attempt to deal with this paradox until the suppressed poems themselves have been largely neglected until now. Okay, so this is... Uh, we saw we saw the advanced copy of this. This is Robert Graves before I, Claudius. This is a Robert Graves before uh, the string of meaty and increasingly weird novels and works of nonfiction. Uh... And this is probably a Robert Graves before the grand self-imposed exile, before he became a straw bonnet wearing expat, sunning himself, you know, in a little too few clothes. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Uh, in this book, the author relates Graves' fascinating life during the period from his birth up to the early 1930s. His experiences in the war, his being left for dead at the Battle of the Somme, his move to Spain, and his final goodbye to uh, Siegfried Sassoon in 1933. In this deeply researched new book, which contains startling archival material never previously revealed and little studied poems, the author traces how Graves' compelling life informed the development of his poetry during the First World War. Okay, so this is going to center on Graves the Poet, who is brilliant. Graves the Poet is brilliant. So, and, uh, and who is who is Jean Moorcroft Wilson when she's at home? That That is our author. How do you like that? <laughs> Did you want to hear her tell you stories? Uh, she is a celebrated biographer and leading expert on First World War poets. Shortlisted for the Duff Cooper Biography Prize for her Isaac Rosenberg, she has also written biographies of Siegfried Sassoon, uh, Charles Hamilton Sorley, and Edward Thomas. She has lectured for many years at the University of London, as well as in the United States and South Africa. She is married to the nephew of Leonard and Virginia Woolf, on whom she has also written a widely praised biography. Okay. All right, so an experienced biographer, and this is uh, just the kind of book that is going to get reviewed everywhere. Uh, this It's due in late October. I'd be amazed if it isn't assigned everywhere in the Western world um, that hasn't done it already. Uh, I'd be amazed if it isn't out on assignment. People will want to write about this particular Robert Graves. The the, the older Robert Graves, the, the strange, weird seer writing these books that after Claudius the God, they, they don't seem to have any, or they seem to have a decreasing interest in having any commercial potential at all. And the utterances get more gnomic, and the personal life gets much more tangled and complicated. Here's hoping that this author follows this volume up with a second one. That would be great. I'll find out. I haven't touched, I haven't touched the advanced copy, so I don't know if there's any mention in here uh, of a second copy forthcoming, that uh, second volume. That would be great if it were. Uh, but one way or another, let's uh, let's move on. This next one is also heavy, also probably a finished copy. <laughs> I cut my disposal unit eagerly waiting. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Oh, what is this? Oh, <laughs> did not know this was coming. Oh my. Okay, this is due in early October. Oh, my. Oh. This is by Miles Taylor, and it is Empress, Queen Victoria, and India. <laughs> Look at that. And this is embossed and in gold. Oh, my. Okay. In this engaging and controversial book, Miles Taylor shows how both Victoria and Albert were spellbound by India and argues that the Queen was humanely, intelligently, and passionately involved with the country throughout her reign, and not just in the last decades. Taylor also reveals the way in which Virginia, Victoria's influence as Empress contributed significantly to India's modernization, both political and economic. This book presents a fresh account of imperial rule in India, suggesting that it was one of Victoria's successes. Amazing! Amazing! Oh, I almost want to stand and cheer. Gimcracky, sentimental, thousand-page biographies of Queen Victoria are a dime a dozen. And schmaltzy, sentimental treatments of her in cinema are a dime a dozen. But almost nobody in, in our current era, in 21st century, the 21st century views 
colonialism as simply a blanket black and white evil. No good of any kind came from it ever at any point in its entire history. And, and Queen Victoria is the, the poster girl for colonialism, for colonial expansion. An empire so big, the sun never sat on it. So, informed, positive, balanced assessments of Victoria's rule are incredibly hard to come by. You'd think that wouldn't be true in a, no, in, a, in a monarch who has been written about so often. But, wow, this could be the kind of book that I scarcely ever read on this monarch. That would be incredible. Uh, let's, who is, who is uh, Miles Taylor? Is that his name? Miles Taylor. Who's Miles Taylor when, he is, when he's at home? Oh, God, please, I'm going to look at his dust jacket photo. Please don't let it be 18. <laughs> oh, all right, there's no photo. Uh, he's a professor of modern history at the University of York. University of York. Uh, between 2008 and 2014, he was the director of the Institute of Historical Research. Okay, so that doesn't tell me much. And this has nice blurbs, uh, including one by Maya Jasnow, who's no, no shakes when it comes to history. And this comes out in early October, and it is mid-September no, mid now. I think I'm justified in reading this now, especially since I don't think I got an advanced copy of this. I think I would have noticed. I would have plotted again. Wow. So this could be a legitimate historical study of Queen Victoria's reign instead of the quips that she made at dinners and the, the widow at Windsor and, uh, and uh, keeping Albert's room exactly as it was when he died and all that kitschy stuff. She, you'd be amazed. I, I can't, I've lost count of how many Victoria biographies I have written in the margins saying, yes, okay, these last ten pages have been entertaining, but wasn't she queen? <laughs> this whole time. <laughs> but, <laughs> and a different kind of queen. Keep in mind, her parliaments never stopped uh, drumbeating about how she had no real power, about the power was theirs in the kingdom. But she didn't believe them. <laughs> and, and never acted like she believed them. She was frustrated when their decisions contravened her will. But she had a degree of sway over her nation's policies that in today's constitutional monarchy... Is, would be unthinkable. Uh, it's Ben Pimlon who wrote about Queen Elizabeth II that if Parliament handed her uh, an, a, an order for her own execution, she would legally have to sign it. <laughs> That's how little power they say she has. I think he overstated the case. Queen Elizabeth II actually has a, a great deal of power that she chooses and has chosen for a century not to use. Uh, but Queen Victoria had tons of power that we don't think of. We just It doesn't enter into the practical picture of her as a working monarch. And maybe this book will. Oh, <laughs> All right. Uh, that was a Steve book. I really... We have one more package. I highly doubt that it will please me as much as this book does. Uh, but we'll give it a try. We'll give it a try and see. And you're going to want this. Yes, of course you are. Oh, come on, Frida. There you go. <laughs> ah. Oh, it's big. You tear it to pieces. You could tear it to pieces. Oh. <laughs> All right, so what have we got? Uh, no. No. Uh, no, it won't please me. It's due soon, though. It's due early in September, so, uh, late in September, so I have to read it. I have the advanced copy, and I haven't, I haven't had the stomach to read it. Uh, but it's, it, I, I clearly should. It's by Rachel Love Newer, and it is poached. Inside the Dark World of Animal Traffic. Uh, and it's from what I've read about it. It's 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 the whole picture. It's not just elephants, of course. It's also pangolins and frozen beetles and frozen birds smuggled in luggage and just the abs the absolute pillage of the natural world. Just uh, uh, the absolute pillage uh, 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 to a degree and with inroads that simply can't be recovered. Uh, anyway, what what quite a few of our, our view are here that weren't here when we originally got this, so I'll, I'll tell you about it. Uh, it comes out in late September uh, from the folks at Decapo Press. Great, great books. Their, uh, their sort of motto is lifelong books. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's of course, <laughs> that's impossible for any publisher to really do, even Penguin Classics. There are plenty of books on that Penguin Classic wall that are not actually classics, and in 50 years no one will know what they are. When you look at Penguin Classics lineup from 50 years ago, you'll see the same thing. Uh, it's rare for any publisher 
to be able to rack up lifelong books. Uh, but I absolutely love the strength and starry-eyed optimism with which the Capo Press continually tries. So we'll uh, we'll see. Uh, this is let's see here. The author learned of the death of mainland Asia's last Javan rhino on an ecology research trip to Vietnam in 2010. Found with her horn hacked off, the killing was driven purely by human greed. The experience raised so many questions about illegal wildlife trading that it compelled Rachel to pursue a career in journalism. After many years of exhaustive field reporting from 12 countries, including Chad, Kenya, China, and back to Vietnam, she delivers an intrepid investigation of a contraband industry worth an estimated $15 billion, yet receiving scant attention. And it's the, the poaching war against elephants is succeeding in wiping them off the face of the earth, and that's with all the attention in the world. There is no attention being given at all to the poaching of giant anteaters. No one cares at all, one way or another. And they bring a far greater price. If you, if you poach a giant anteater, or better yet, capture one alive, and you are living on the equivalent of a hundred US dollars a year, and suddenly you have a chance to make five thousand, you'll do it. And, and there, uh, there are no ecologists in foxholes, I guess is the way to put it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, poached plunges the reader into the dark world of the illegal wildlife trade, accompanying a hunter stalking his endangered prey in a Vietnamese jungle, tracking down an illegal pangolin scare dealer, scale dealer in a uh, uh, Chinese side alley, and being offered a shot of alcohol mixed with ground rhino horn at a trendy restaurant in Hanoi. From the front lines where the law is being flouted to the conservationists, rangers, and activists who believe it is not too late to stop the impending extinctions, Poached is a narrative of the forces behind illegal wildlife trade and where it is all headed. As you can see, <laughs> you can tell why I've been putting off reading this. Uh, you got you got a, a bright, sunny, not today, but you, you have a bright, sunny afternoon and you're parked on your couch and everything's comfortable and your little puppy is happily chewing on a toy and there's not a human anywhere around, not anywhere in the building, not anywhere on the block, and you've got your laptop all ready and the whole world in front of you and summer breeze is blowing through the window. You really don't want to pick this up if you have other books to read, and that's not right. That, that, that's not right at all. The sad stories are important, too. So uh, this comes out in late September, and as usual on this channel, the, the arrival of the finished copy is sort of a telling me, you get get to it. Take take the time and read this book because uh, it's it's due. I'll need to write about it. So, all right. So we have poached inside the world of illegal animal trafficking. We have Empress by Miles Taylor uh, with gold letters even on the spine, so you can't really see it in this dim day. Uh, about a Queen Victoria and India, and then we have Robert Graves. That's so two works of serious, uh, what seems like serious scholarship, right in a row. That's great. Plus poached. Uh, not a bad non-fiction haul. This is a, a volume about the comparatively young Robert Graves, the, the young man, the, the poet, the World War I soldier. Uh, a Robert Graves that maybe not everyone's familiar with. That, that'll be fun. And it'll also be fun to see that whole world, the World War I poets, uh, reflected through a new lens. Through, uh, then we have The Collector's Apprentice by B.A. Shapiro, a historical novel set in uh, Paris of the 1930s. And then three slim volumes that started us off. The Sadness of Beautiful Things, by Simon Van Boy. This is uh, short stories. Uh, one of the only pieces of fiction that we got today. Uh, then The Conspiracy Against the Human Race by Thomas Ligotti, which is the author of fairly taut horror stories. Uh, it, it, the, it sounds like in this book the author of those taut and fairly well-controlled horror stories is given a few shots of bourbon and asked to wander. <laughs> we'll see if it's any good. Sometimes those books are wonderful. And then last, Another Life which is a, an author approaching old age and just reflecting on a life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> and so it's a thin book, and that might end up being a godsend since those books tend to be insufferable. We, we shall see. I will report back. Uh, so I guess I've got my reading set out for me. I'll, I'll, read, uh, I'll read this thing. That'll, that'll take no time at all. But the, the clear books here, the clear duty here, is Poached and Empress. So I will use the one as a motivation to read the other. I will read Poach telling myself, get through this book, pay it serious attention, take lots of notes, and as a reward, you can read Empress. <laughs> but don't read Empress first. 
I guess that's what I'll do. <laughs> so so that's it. That is our rainy day mail haul to start off the week. Uh, and uh, with any luck, there'll be more mail tomorrow. I don't think there's going to be any more today. On rainy days and blustery days like this, my other drivers tend to uh, pull a no-show. So, so this will probably be it. Uh, but this video is long enough as it is. So I'll, I'll wrap this up, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.